and now the end is near. <laughs> so in this final video, I want to bring it back sort of full circle. We started off by considering differences between a classical and quantum state all the way back in video one or video two, all the way back in chapter one, all those many centuries ago. In this video, what I want to do is show that there are core principles, of course, that are absolutely central to quantum physics and to classical physics, and they're the same principles in terms of conservation laws. We're going to, I wish I had time, I really wish I had time to, to do this topic justice, because it could be the focus of um, not just a module, an entire course. In fact, in year three, there is a module called Symmetry and Action Principles in Physics that if you're interested in pursuing the, the sort of broader themes of this video and chapter eight of the notes is well worth considering taking. Um, but in particular, something called Noether's Theorem, and apologies again for the pronunciation, which is an absolutely beautiful theorem due to Emmy Noether back in, I believe, 1915. Sorry, I've got that wrong. Um, which basically says that once we've got a symmetry in nature, we've got a conservation law. So if we have symmetry in time, we have conservation of energy. If we have symmetry in space, we have conservation of linear momentum. If we have rotational symmetry, we have conservation of angular momentum. It's been described as the most beautiful theorem in physics and with quite some justification it's it's really really elegant if you're looking for something to do in a spare moment over the christmas break try looking up emmy Noether and trying to find out as much as you can about her and her theorem i've linked in the notes to a couple of aspects so well a couple of brief descriptions of Noether's theorem but it's you know you're not going to regret looking into her in more detail no, it's not, going to be an it's not going to be examinable material, so in that sense you can't skip it, but in terms of broadening your understanding, and I would say appreciation for the elegance and beauty of physics, well worth looking up Emmy Noether. Another core principle is the correspondence principle, which in essence states that classical physics is a limiting case of quantum physics to the, in the sense that as you make the Planck constants closer and closer to zero, which is the same as saying as you make the de Broglie wavelength closer and closer to zero, we reach the, the, we reach the classical world as a limiting case of quantum physics. So we're going to touch on that conservation law. We're also going to come back to that conundrum I left you with all the way back at the end of chapter three in terms of that evolving wave packet and how it, the evolving Gaussian wave packet spreads in, in space, spreads in this position representation. It's a function of time, but the momentum representation it stays exactly rock solid, it doesn't change. What does that mean in terms of the uncertainty principle? What does that mean in terms of the dynamics of um, quantum systems? And what does it mean in terms of conservation principles, in particular, the conservation of momentum? Okay, let's think about the time evolution of a system, going all the way back. We started off thinking about, you know, we drop a ball. Classically, what we do is we think about the state of that system, at, various instances of time. You've seen that we've done that a lot throughout the quantum world as well. We've taken the state of our system at t equal to zero and then looked at how it evolves. And the Schrodinger equation is deterministic and linear. The real key core issue is when we make a measurement and we collapse the system into an eigenfunction of the operator um, associated with the particular observable we're measuring. Um, that's when things go a little bit bizarre. But the Schrodinger equation itself is an entirely deterministic equation in terms of mapping one state in time to the next state in time as long as we leave the system alone. Right, let's start by writing down the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And we'll write it in terms of the state vector, the state cat. Represents the evolution of our system in time. However, we can also write this as in terms of a no, in terms of a operator, which we're going to call U.
In fact, the state doesn't have to start off at t. It could start off at any earlier time, t0. But I'll leave it starting at t equal to 0 just for um, consistency in terms of what we looked at previously. So can we see that? No, we can't. So this is telling us the state of our system at a given time. Let me put that in t. We operate using our time evolution operator or propagator, as it's sometimes called, on the system to get our new state. It's an alternative approach to this. Now, this might look strange, different new language, different bracket language. Actually, you've seen the form of this. We've worked actually with the form of this operator quite a bit. Let me explain where it comes from. So this equation works for any state, for any state psi. So that means that if it works for any state psi, it must also hold for the operators themselves. So what we then have is this equation. Which seems a little strange in terms of perhaps a differential equation based around operators rather than variables, but it's entirely valid. And we can solve that, and you can solve it very easily, and you've seen how to solve this many times before. First order differential equation. What's our solution going to be? Our solution's going to be, you know what the solution's going to be, I hope. We've seen this type of thing many times before. You've seen it many times before throughout first year. Actually at A-level as well. I hope you know what the solution to a first order differential equation like this looks like. Is that. Hopefully that does look familiar. And if t equals zero, then we can simplify this even further. Is it t equal to zero, this is going to be equal to one. This has got the same form we've seen many times over. In that, if we've got the eigenfunctions of our, think of the particle in a box again, eigenfunctions, operates on the eigenfunction to give this back, then what we'll have up here is for example, for each, for the nth eigenfunction. We've used this a lot. So we've taken, we've seen how a system ever evolves in time from a t equal to zero state. A back in the box thing I keep bringing up at every available opportunity to try and hammer home the idea that not every state is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. We have superpositions, they will evolve in time only if we've got an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian is a time independent, which is a result we're going to be coming back to very soon. But you've seen this, you've seen this form before. In fact, some of you even coded up a simulation that, that used the, these factors. Now, what we say is that this operator, this time evolution or operator, also called a, a propagator, um, is unitary. Before I get, get on to describe what unitary is, I need to be very careful and very clear here. Time is not an observable in a quantum system. It's not like we have an operator, just don't get it into your head that we apply this operator and then we somehow pull out a time value. That's not what it's doing. What it's doing is it's evolving the system in time for us. But it's not like we can apply an omission operator and pull out a value of an observable, an eigenfunction associated with that operator like we do for, for observables in quantum mechanics. That's not how time works in quantum mechanics. Time isn't an observable, it's a parameter. So somewhat subtle from some perspectives, not at all subtle from other perspectives distinction, but just don't get it into your idea that we have an observable. Just because I'm using the term operator, don't think that that means it's an emission operator and therefore we're pulling out an observable. This is just evolving the system in time for us. Moreover, that operator is unitary. What do I mean by unitary? Effectively, it means that it preserves the unit norm of the state vector. What does that in turn mean? What it means is that it preserves this. So the norm is preserved. What does that mean? Well, let me get rid of some of this. In terms of wave mechanics language, hopefully you know already well, what it means. Oh, whatever volume. 
the amount of milk we choose. And what does that in turn mean? It means the probability is conserved. So it's a unitary means that we are conserving the sort of unit probability is perhaps one way of thinking about it or remembering it. Um, and we are preserving the norm of the state vector is in more mathematical language and making sure that probability remains conserved. And that has to be the case for a closed system. And I use closed in the same sense as you've used it in thermal and statistical physics, not open to, you know, energy or matter flow or information flow. Just the, it's a closed system. It's not open to the outside world. And therefore, the probability must be conserved. It can't, it doesn't leak out as such. Hence, we need a unitary operator that preserves that, that um, probability. Following directly from that, a unitary operator has the um, property that its emission conjugate, complex conjugate, switch um, rows and columns, transpose rows and columns, you remember, times the um, matrix itself, let's leave it as a matrix, is equal to the identity matrix. So if we take this and multiply by its complex conjugate transpose, we get the identity matrix. You think about that just in the context of right. So for the for the time evolution operator, what we have assuming of starting off at t equal to zero. Um, so this is a matrix, so this is a matrix. This is just a single value, this is just a single phase value if we're just taking one single eigenvalue here. Notice what happens if we get the complex conjugate. It's the same old story over and over again. If we get the complex conjugate together this and multiply it by this, we get one. The modulus is one. So exactly all we're doing is taking the arguments that we have for those single values and transposing them, no, translating them, not transposing, Trans transposing is not a good word in this context, translating them to a matrix conjugate. <laughs> oh my, we're getting close to the end. Um, we're taking this argument with regard to taking this, multiplying it by its complex conjugate, just and moving that into the context of matrices where we're taking the emission conjugate, multiplying it by the matrix and getting back the identity matrix. Okay, just as we take that, multiply it by its complex, complex conjugate and get one. Just to hammer this home, we've assumed up to this point, for good reason, because we're about to show that this is indeed the case, but we've assumed that when we wrote um, a wave function like this, uh, I'll stick with, in terms of a basis set of our eigenfunctions, that these didn't have a time dependence. We've assumed that. Let's just make sure in this final video that there are no loopholes and that's indeed the case. Okay, substituting in our expression for the linear combination of the basis states of the basis eigenfunctions, we get this. Now those basis functions aren't a function of time. So that means we can in turn write this. Now that means for each of those eigenfunctions, we can have a separate differential equation, which will look like this. So that's for each individual state, nth state, nth eigenfunction um, of the Hamiltonian. Okay, first order differential equation. Same idea, cropping up time and time again, implies its solution is going to be See, it's all nicely consistent, as we might hope. Now, that's our time dependence. Remember, 
We've always, when we've been talking about probabilities based around those coefficients, we've always talked about the modulus squared. Because this can be a complex number. Just like the wave function is a complex function. Notice what's going to happen. If we take the modulus squared of that, what's going to happen? This term is going to drop out. And we're left with the fact that our probabilities don't change in time. Probabilities, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the probabilities for the energy eigenvalues. So the energy eigenvalues that we um, measure, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, the expectation value of energy is time independent. It's all to do with that initial mixture. So our coefficients, which tell us the probability of measuring each energy eigenvalue, are time independent, of course, in the absence of making a measurement. Let's be clear. This is all to do with the system just evolving in time, going about its own business without anybody coming in and making a measurement or without it interacting with its environment. More broadly speaking. So this is what we've assumed. We've assumed all along that the coefficients were time independent and the coefficients are time independent. So let's look at the time dependence of other expectation values. So let's think of a more, you know, a general operator O, and its expectation value is going to be that. And what we want to know is uh, which is going to be that quantity time derivative of that quantity. Remember what we're doing here with the bras and cats. We've got a row vector, which is a transpose conjugate of the column vector, but then we've also got a matrix here. So in terms of doing this differentiation, we've effectively got the product, not effectively, we have the product rule. We've got to take the product rule into consideration because all of these things in principle can depend on time. And I've tried writing this out once by hand and it's a mess, so I'm going to use better TypeScript. We get that when we use the product rule, which in turn we can write along these lines. Make sure you can just follow the logic through. It's, it's quite subtle, but make sure you can follow the logic through that takes us from that time derivative of the expectation value to here and then on to here. In this, notice that we've got d psi, d tau, both the bra and the ket for the state vector psi. So that suggests that what we do is we, so we go back to our time dependence throw down our equation. Let's, we want this by itself. Just dividing through by i h bar. So that's the ket side. And if that's the ket side, it means the bra side. And that is equation, hang on, a d a t in the notes. So we've got the time derivative for a bra, time derivative for a ket here. So then we plug those in and we get this. Rearrange things a little bit. And we get this, and just bringing that i over h bar outside, we get this. Now, notice the order of the operators here. We've got the Hamiltonian, we've got a combination which strongly suggests that we should think, be thinking about a commutator. And indeed, we can compress this notation and introduce a commutator. And we do that, we get this. And now we can simplify this even further if we assume that the operator isn't changing in time. That means we finally end up with this much simpler expression. And that ultimately means we end up with this. So the time dependence of our expectation value for our observable is that factor of i over h bar. And then we've got our bracket where we've got our commutator between uh, okay time dependence of our expectation values for an observable an operator o associated with an observable o really important to note 
What happens if the operator commutes with the Hamiltonian? If the operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, the commutator is going to be zero, and this is going to be zero, which means that the expectation value for our observable that commutes with the Hamiltonian, whose operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, is not going to change in time any either. So if you've got observables, if you've got operators that commute with the Hamiltonian, then like, just like the Hamiltonian's um, expectation value doesn't change in time, those observables' expectation value isn't going to change in time. Powerful result, really powerful result, following out just a relatively simple observation that this commutator would be zero if the um, operators commute. So we're going to apply this to the position of the momentum operators, neither of which in general commute with the Hamiltonian, so this is not going to drop out and become uh, zero. So only in the case of an absolutely free particle do the um, momentum, we've seen this before, do the momentum and um, Hamiltonian operators commute. And what we're going to see is when we apply this to position and momentum, we're going to see that there's really quite neat links with classical physics laws, with Newton's laws, as long as we're again in the right limit, which I'll get to. And this is called the Ehrenfest theorem, and we are at section 8.5 of the notes. So how's our expectation value for a position operator going to vary in time? Well, it's going to be this. So what is this? Well, it's the expectation value associated with that commutator. So this can also be written and is often written like this. So it's the expectation value of that quantity. What is that expectation value? Well, we can work that through. So we have this commutator. What's a Hamiltonian? A Hamiltonian is this kinetic energy term. Potential energy term, potential only depends on x, no time dependence. That. So, commutator between potential and x is zero. Why? Think about that. That means that what we're left with is... And I want you to show that that is... And I should point out that everywhere I'm using P here, what I really mean is that. So we're talking about um, uh, just one dimension here. So our operator is just referring to a derivative in the x direction. But hopefully it's clear from the context here. So every time I've written this, then I actually mean this. But given that we've only got one dimension in this problem, it's fine. So, make sure you can show that. Okay, so having evaluated that commutator, we go back to... And what we had was this. Which, in turn, it's just... Make sure we don't drop any terms. Uh, so that was p squared over 2m. So you've calculated the commutator between p squared and x. So let's not forget this 2m two, two term. So that's equal to i h bar 1 over 2m. And then your commutator was minus 2i h bar p. And it's the expectation value. Because the commutator's inside, it's the expectation value of, of um, the momentum operator. Okay, where does that get us? That goes, that goes, that obviously goes, that obviously goes. I by I gives us minus 1 by minus. So what we end up with is just that, which is a very neat and tidy result indeed. From a couple of perspectives. First of all, no h bar. H bar is gone. So that's interesting from a quantum mechanics perspective, first of all. 
Secondly, uh, that's, make sure I put the operator on there. Um, and secondly, well, what is this? Let's say if this quantity, if it wasn't the expectation, let's say it was just x. Let's say we did, we could equate the expectation value with the value of x. That would be dx dt. What's dx dt? It's velocity. What would this be if we could equate the expectation value to the classical variable itself? So if this was p, well, that would be mv. What's p? It's mv divided by m gives us v. Momentum is our mass times our rate of change of position or our mass times our velocity. Fundamental classical physics just pops out. The important thing is to make that approximation to classical physics is that we've got to be in a limit where this is indeed equal to our classical variable x or this is indeed and this is indeed equal to our classical variable p. Okay, I'm running out of joke, so I'm going to have to do this the digital way, um, which means you're probably going to be able to read it better anyway. So apologies, I'm covered in joke. It's, I've just got crumbs left. So we're going to cover the time evolution now of the expectation value for momentum. So we kick off here, which is our equation 829 in the notes. And... So we need to calculate that commutator. Now, the commutator between p squared over 2m and p, convince yourself, is zero. So what we now need to do is to evaluate that commutator between the potential and the momentum. Gives us this. We plug in an arbitrary function f of x so we can do that commutator. Remember to use the product rule. And in the end, well, it only takes one line, really. We get this. Okay, so this is a cornerstone of classical physics. You've seen this in many, many contexts. When I used to teach frontiers in first year, I'd say the students should tattoo upon the, this upon themselves. So what it's telling us is the force is the negative gradient of the potential. You've seen that in countless um, places, including not least classical fields this year. So what this and this are, are basically statements of something called Ehrenfest's theorem. And Ehrenfest's theorem is that if we can identify the expectation values of quantum mechanical um, operators with their classical counterparts, so in this case the expectation value of the x, the position operator with position, expectation value of the momentum operator with momentum, then what we do rather neatly is recover the classical laws of motion, basically Newton's laws. It's a really neat result, but you've got to ask yourself under what conditions does it, um, you know, does this work? And of course, it all boils down to length scales again. You know, the reason I don't diffract when I walk through that door, you don't diffract when you walk through the door of your bedroom, is all to do ultimately with, in terms of de Broglie wavelength, your de Broglie wavelength is teensy, 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 tiny. So, and also you're not a phase coherent wave function, there is that as well. Um, so, so, when does Ehrenfest's theorem hold? Well, I've ripped this nice little diagram off directly from a great set of notes from a course at MIT uh, that you can find it pretty quickly online. I think I'm, I linked to it in the notes. Um, but this is a great diagram. And what it's telling us is that ultimately it's all to do with length scales. It's all to do with the degree of localization of the wave function. And if the, the wave function is very localized, so we're getting to the classical limit whereby we've got a delta function for position rather than a spread out delocalized wave function, then Ehrenfest's theorem holds. Um, however, obviously, if we've got a delocalized wave function, as in the case over here, then we can't equate the, um, the expectation value for position with position itself or the expectation value for momentum with the momentum at a particular position. And what it shows is that only in the case when you've got a very localized wave function, and localized in the sense that the spatial variation of the wave function is small compared to the spatial variation of the um, potential, and therefore the force, which is the negative gradient of the potential, can we, can we use Ehrenfest's theorem? But still, under those conditions where we have a localized wave function in the context of the overall potential or overall force, then we recover, in that limit, we recover the classical laws of motion. Have a great holiday. I will see you next semester and look forward to more synchronous sessions with you. And I look forward to working with you again. See you later. Bye.